Um, I want to talk to you about an issue that's very deep to my heart, um, but it's going to be an issue that raises some difficult questions. So every time I speak about intercultural education around the world, it, it's quite a confronting um, dilemma for countries everywhere. Um, but it does bring us up against some of the real difficulties that contemporary society has. Uh, yeah. So, when you look, walk down the street, the first thing you notice is the globalization of cons consumption. McDonald's, Starbucks, KFC, even across the road I notice this. So globalization of consumer goods, of monies, of economies, is an international phenomenon. Now accompanying that, of course, we've got a globalization of language. I grew up in Australia. When I was growing up, the only signs in my neighborhood were English signs. Now, of course, they're in Thai, they're in Mandarin, um, and when I go to other parts of the world, it's a multilingual uh, world. And our societies have become much more multicultural. In Australia, 50% of the population was either born overseas or has a parent born overseas. So Australians are particularly multicultural, but that pattern um, also applies elsewhere in the world. And that multiculturalism, though, operates in different sorts of ways. In some cases, um, it's people moving into a country, particularly in relation to the Philippines, it's people moving out of the Philippines um, in search of work. And working in Hong Kong, one of the things that's a feature of Hong Kong society is that on every Sunday is the day off for the Filipino helpers, and they are out in the, the parks socialising. 11% um, of the Filipino of the Philippine population works overseas. Now that's the same number as this of the population of Portugal, of Jordan. And when you think about some of those, the dilemmas that having parents living away from home creates for young people in terms of growing up, in a sense of community, in a sense of a close family, it becomes another one of those challenges of a world that's increasingly smaller because of the ease of travel. Now, globalization and travel and communication are often presented to us as being positives. You know, we're connected 24-7. But one of the problems with that phenomenon, of course, is that it has increased a huge disparity of wealth globally, from extreme poverty to crazy rich Asians, the latest hit <laughs> movie. Um, so there are some who have benefited from the phenomenon of globalization, um, greater mobility, e economic transference, there's a larger percentage that have actually suffered as a consequence. Now, the Philippines, of course, is an incredibly diverse nation, 175 ethno-linguistic groupings, it's also atypical because it has one of the highest literacy rates in all of Asia. Um, and statistically, poverty and unemployment are declining, although not as fast as, it, as anybody would like. But it's a post-colonial society, and the remnants of colonial occupation um, are very obvious. geographic map doesn't really reflect the realities of life in, in the Philippines, as you know. Because ethnic groups don't neatly stay 
in the borders, the coloured borders that map, mapping experts put them in. It's a much more fluid relationship. There's much more mobility and movement towards the city. Um, and at the same time as that, if we think about that phenomenon globally in terms of mobility, we've actually got in 2016, there were 265 million people who were forcibly displaced from their own country. 25 million refugees. So the mobility and dislocation of people internationally is becoming a huge problem. Interestingly, the Philippines also has a, a, a much, much smaller percentage of movement in and out of the country. Um, but it also has a lot of movement within those different geographic areas. This is a visualisation that just gives you um, a sense of the movement of people around the world between different countries. So what it depicts very graphically, I think, is that the diversity migration flows are worldwide. There are only a few countries where there is 100% migration out and no migration in, and you can probably think of those countries, places like Syria, for example. Um, and so every country in the world, both through migration but also through internal movement, is becoming much, much more diverse. Now, the growth of diversity all right, has a huge impact on how we operate our schools, how we do education. Let's just look a little bit more closely at travel for work. And these are the statistics from the Philippines from 2015. And it shows the flow of overseas workers to different countries. Now, you'll see Hong Kong, where I live, is actually a very, very small um, compared to places like Saudi Arabia and other countries in, in Asia. But the consequences are profound. And there was a story that hit the South China Morning Post at the beginning of this year, which was a story about a, a young boy in his 20s who was taking his mother on a tour of Asia. His mother was, had retired. She was 60 years old. She was a Filipino helper who had been living away from her six children since she was in her early 20s. Now the experience, the consequences that has for how you actually maintain relationships, how you continue intimacy, is something that we have to tackle in our schools. So it's all part of a much more complex portrait of societies becoming much more diverse, much more mobile, interconnected, but also disconnected in many ways. Now, we all know that there are differences between different cultural groups. And when I talk about culture here, I'm talking about ethnic groups. Um, take the example of queuing. So queuing can work very differently amongst different groups in society. In some societies, you queue in a neat, orderly, patient way. And you just work, wait, and move forward. In other societies, um, someone does the queuing for you to try and manage the, um, the crowd. In other societies, It's a lot less structured. 
And if it's the Christmas sales in London, it's completely out of control. So these cultural patterns are often part of the things that we, we don't even think about. They're part of our daily life, they're part of our traditions and our customs and ways of being in the world. But how we see particular cultures and particular ethnic groups depends very much on our perceptions. In sociology, we call it our positionality. How we understand our position in relation to others, to a particular object, whether that's a person, whether it's a particular cultural practice, whether it's a particular artifact. So what do we see here? What are your impressions? Well, the first thing I notice is a studious young man studying hard. Good chance of success because he's applying himself to his studies. But if I was a person in poverty, how would I view that picture? So I suggest to you I'd see it very, very differently. Not a young man who's applying himself and destined for success. I see someone of incredible privilege. A computer enough space to have a desk at home, electricity. So how we view a particular phenomenon is very much dependent on our position. And we are often so enculturated into our particular position that we don't realise <coughs> um, how much it affects how we view the world. We are positioned in society makes a huge difference to our sense of belonging. Now, belonging is a, a fairly nebulous but also very well developed concept, both in sociology and in psychology. But when we have extensive diversity and increasing diversity in society, whether that diversity is due to ethnicity, wealth and poverty, religion, gender, then there's a risk that people will feel that they don't belong. It becomes much more complicated when we actually belong to multiple communities. And this is what technology um, has done for us, is it's created Membership of multiple communities. There's family, there's friends, peer group, there's schools, but there's also your various online communities, um, your in online networks, workplace. So we actually belong to multiple communities and technology has diversified those communities. And those communities are no longer simply geographically placed. They're not the communities in your local neighbourhood. They may well be global communities. So when my daughter was growing up, I was very impressed that you know, she was establishing friends on Facebook who were international, um, until I discovered that one of them was a prisoner in a United States jail. <laughs> one of the dilemmas of a parent who doesn't want to show her child to a And her defense was, he's a really nice guy. You know, I really feel a connection with him. <laughs> so as parents and as educators, where young people feel this sense of belonging becomes a real issue for us that we actually can't ignore. Now there are 
is extensive research in psychology and in sociology that tells us the benefits of a very strong sense of belonging. And it's very much connected to the issue of diversity. So if you feel that you are, if you have a sense of belonging and you live in a very diverse society, what the research shows us is it does improve students' academic outcomes, it makes a big difference to their health and well-being, even at university level. For kids at school, they are much more likely to complete school if they feel a sense of connectedness and belonging to their school. They are far more likely to move on to tertiary education and succeed and to have the sorts of capacities that they're going to need in a workplace that's becoming increasingly global. In terms of schools, having students and a teaching staff that is both diverse and has a sense of longing creates a much more cohesive and positive school or university environment. If we look at business, the business research shows us that having a diverse population in your business and a population that feels that they belong improves productivity and creativity by 35%. So these are the sort of statistics uh, that we can't ignore. And the ones about young people are particularly important, I think, as we see an increasing problem with issues around isolation, um, self-harm, bullying, increasing pressure, even suicide amongst young people. So the question, I want to tackle is what can we as educators do to support belonging and diversity for social inclusion, justice and cohesion in a world that's becoming increasingly complex. Now I, I do know that there are lots of different approaches that we can adopt. I'm going to talk about one particular approach, and it's a, a, a global or international um, approach, and that's around intercultural education. So I'm going to be talking today about three things. And I'm going to make three propositions to you and try and persuade you of these. You can tell me at the end in the break whether I've persuaded you. All right, the first is, I'm going to talk a bit about culture. Not in our traditional knowledge of culture, but a culture is a much more complex construct. And I'm going to be arguing that culture, society, and schooling are so intertwined we can't ignore them when we're educators. I'm also going to be describing for you a little bit about intercultural education um, as a, an approach for strengthening positive values and a sense of belonging to social inclusion, and a bit about its history, where it's come from, how it's developed. And then I'm going to be sharing with you some research that I've done um, in Australia around some practical strategies that schools have used to implement intercultural education at the individual level, at, in schools, and more broadly in society. Um, I will be referring to some research and throughout, and as much as legally possible, I've put all the research on ResearchGate um, for you to download free of access, and the address is actually at the end of the presentation. So any research that I refer to, um, you'll be able to get open access to. Alright, so that's the first issue. What is culture? We can't understand intercultural education without actually understanding the concept of culture. Australia, as a multicultural society, has got a long tradition of multicultural education in schools. Since the 1970s, we're supposed to be 
be teaching multicultural education. Um, what that really has often involved is celebrations of food, flags, and festivals. And just about every primary school across Australia would always have a multicultural day where all the kids and the families would bring in the food of their traditional culture, dress in traditional costume, and then forget about it for the rest of the year. <laughs> now, those issues of cultural differences are becoming much less relevant um, in a very global, digitised world. In a world where down the corner you've got Starbucks, KFC and McDonald's. When I was growing up, my mother was known as a very exotic cook. Because the standard fare in Australia was very British um, food. That usually was a lump of meat, overcooked, three vegetables, overcooked, and the vegetables were always beans, carrot, and mashed potatoes. And it doesn't matter what part of Australia you were born on, when you meet up with someone of your generation on the other side of the country, you say, now what sort of food did you have growing up? And it's always, oh, meat, beans, carrots, mashed potatoes. Now my mother was known as a very exotic cook because once every two weeks she used to make spaghetti bolognese. It had no resemblance to spaghetti bolognese that any Italian would recognise. Right. Now, um, Australian cuisine is, is fusion. It's very, very Asian. Um, different ethnic groups are represented at every shopping centre, in every menu or cookbook, um, in a restaurant and at home. It's a very different sort of culture around food, as it is in just about every country as a consequence of migration and globalisation. So, those sorts of images or ways of representing culture are becoming far less relevant. Um, so we need then to have a better and broader understanding of what culture is because cultures aren't static. And this is one of the problems with the food, flags and festivals approach. It presumes that nothing changes. And thank goodness, growing up on British food is not what Australian kids have to suffer nowadays. That has changed. So the first thing that we need to know is that a simple definition of culture is it's the glue that binds us together? Even if we don't need it, know each other or live in the same geographic place. Now, com communication has meant that diasporas are becoming a much more prominent force internationally and um, politically, as we see in the United States' as relationship with Israel, for example. Um, and Indian community of diaspora in the United States, also in, in Asia, is very, very powerful. China has now, has recently, yeah, because we're very conscious of what China does in Hong Kong, um, China has recently announced that anybody of Chinese descent is automatically a, a citizen of China. Um, so that the diaspora all right, becomes part of the nation. So even though you don't know the people in your particular cultural group, um, you are part of it or designated part of it. A more sophisticated notion is that culture is about the ideas, values, norms and practices and behaviours that we create, we share, but also that we can test. Um, 
amongst different groups of people, but these are how we actually see and interpret the world. So think back to the example of the boy sitting at the desk, right? someone from an affluent, educated, cultural background interprets that differently from someone from a poor background. Now what we have to remember is that each group that we belong to has its own culture. So culture is just not limited to ethnicity. One of the most powerful things I found as a researcher is going around to schools. And when you walk into a school, there is almost a palpable sense of the school culture. For the research project I'm going to be talking about a little bit further on, I visited two primary schools, both in very culturally and ethnically diverse, um, low socioeconomic areas um, and disadvantaged areas in Western Sydney. Um, and I went into one school and it was chaos. There was this sense of everybody, a palpable feeling of everybody living on the edge. There were kids crying, there were teachers rushing around. There hadn't been any crisis, it was just a normal school day. <laughs> Um, we had to wait <coughs> half an hour before anybody at reception could find time to talk to us, even though we had an appointment. I went into the next school. Calm. It was just before Christmas. There was a Christmas tree in the corner. The big pile of tin goods to give to St. Vincent de Paul had been all bought in. They were expecting us. It was every, everything was organised. It was a very, very different aura that came from a very different sort of culture. So culture isn't food, flags and vegetables. It's not necessarily material and concrete. Culture can make itself felt in a physical and emotional sense. Cultures also trans transcend geographical borders. And cultures often are supranational. So particularly now, we have supranational organisations. And I'm thinking here of groups like the United Nations, ASEAN, UNICEF, um, International Disaster and Recovery Association, UNESCO. These are organisations with a discrete culture that straddle, whose work straddles multiple nations. And so they always bring and infuse their particular culture into the countries that they're dealing with. Most importantly, cultures aren't fixed in time because they're always intersecting with other elements and other forces. So, when I was growing up, the only festivals that either Catholic or public schools in Australia celebrated were Christmas and Easter. Well, now every school, Catholic and, and government, also celebrates all the Hindu and Muslim festivals as well, as a consequence of that migration and the intersection of different cultures. Now, this is where intercultural education is distinctive from other uh, notions like multicultural education. Every society in the contemporary world is multicultural. It's made up of multiple different groups. Intercultural is about the intersection, about the dialogue, about the engagement, the interrelationship between different cultures. And it's because it's about that intersection that we need to look at it particularly closely. So if we think about culture, this is a much more nuanced way of viewing different cultures and this is a development of a, a framework developed by an American um, anthropologist originally, Mr. Hall, who was teaching um, communication theory to American expats. 
who were about to, or Americans who were about to go overseas on aid programs immediately after the Second World War. And this iceberg concept of culture, I think, can be very, very helpful. So we do have the surface culture for different ethnic groups. That's the food, flags, and festivals. That's also the literature, the language, celebrations, crafts. And then we have what is called shallow culture, and possibly you know, these terms might be a little bit more developed for the contemporary era. But these are things like concept of time, conversation patterns, personal space, ways of queuing, uh, ways of child rearing, social interactions. I remember that I had a, a stint. Um, I was backpacking when I was younger through Indonesia. And one of the things that the Indonesians would say when you're, you're waiting for a ferry, you're waiting for time, is relax. Indonesian rubber time. And their view was, well, things just happen. They happened when they happened. And so this was a, a cultural adjustment for us. Then there's what's called deep culture. All right? And this is the, the sort of complex level of cultural interaction that intercultural education aims to, to develop. And it's things like the concept of the self, concept of past and, and future, um, attitudes towards dependence, problem solving, kinship, issues around sexuality, relationships across the generations and so on. So if we think of culture as being much more multi-level, we start to realise that we have to move beyond surface culture to looking at the much deeper versions. So how do we translate that into intercultural education? So intercultural education actually developed in the 1990s as a particular approach for handling diversity. Uh, within nations. And I'm talking here about ethnic diversity. It was a period, it was developed first in France, um, and it was largely in response to the increasing flows of migrants um, into Europe, but it was also in response to a disillusionment with multiculturalism as a particular policy approach in Europe. And it was, was helped along a little bit by the leaders of Germany, Britain, and France coming out in 2010, 2011, and declaring multiculturalism is dead. Um, but it has a much longer philosophical history that dates immediately from the um, from immediately after the Second World War and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Now, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights argues that human rights, that there are three fundamental values that all of the societies in Europe and beyond agreed on after the Second World War. Human rights, democracy, and the rule of law. Now, the UN led the way. It was taken up by the Council of Europe, which was a, an association that actually set the laws that countries in Europe, that were member countries, were to agree to. It was taken up by the World Bank, by UNESCO. But in democratic societies, we were going to advocate for these three principles past agreements, policies, legislation that were going to enforce these, um, and that that was one of the frameworks for moving forward and for avoiding ever again the sorts of tragedies that happened during World War II. Now, the history is important, right, because not every country in the world um, supported the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Britain was unenthusiastic. 
uh, and delayed signing because it was concerned that presenting human rights as the principle that Britain agreed to was going to be detrimental to its empire and its control over countries in its empire. The United States refused to sign for four years because it was concerned that if it signed an international agreement on human rights, then it would have mean that it had to act on some of the racist laws and practices in its various territories and states. They did eventually sign, and from that principle of human rights, the, a whole series of different treaties have been established. These are, have always emphasised very strongly, but increasingly, the importance of education. I've listed four of those, uh, sorry, three of those here. The White Paper on Intercultural Dialogue, on Living Together and Combining Diversity in the 21st Century, on Intercultural Dialogue and Cultural Diversity. Now, one of the main groups that took up the agenda of intercultural education was UNESCO. And UNESCO has also written a whole series of guidelines and policies and approaches. Now, the involvement of these supranational agencies is really important because it has meant that the principles of the United Nations and of UNESCO have permeated through many countries in the world. Um, it hasn't permeated through the United States, um, which has, although it signed the original declaration, has not signed any, has not signed or has delayed signing um, any subsequent agreements by the United Nations or UNESCO. Um, and it only endorsed the Treaty Against Genocide, which was written in 1949, um, 40 years after the event. Um, it's certainly not been endorsed um, by China, um, and which has moved into a new digital era, what's been described as a digital de dictatorship, where we now have face recognition um, and a social contact, contract, social credit. Everybody's given 800 points, and then you're tracked, and you lose or gain points, depending on what you're doing. So going into a shopping centre, and buying a, a bottle of wine for dinner loses you a couple of points. Buying nappies is okay because it means you're really a responsible parent. Um, so it isn't a universal approach, but we do have intercultural education as a formal policy in many countries around the world. Australia is one, it's just become a mandated requirement for all students. Um, in its, the national curriculum, Germany, Finland, Greece, Ireland, Switzerland, um, and a version of it in, in Canada. Now one of the key things that intercultural education is based on is the concept of intercultural dialogue. So this is a process of working collaboratively across different groups so, so that then you can, meet, can live together respectfully, harmoniously, and in accordance with those universal values of human rights, democracy, and the rule of law. The other principle of intercultural dialogue is that teaching it is essential for conflict management, belonging, and cultural cohesion. So what it says is the best way to manage issues around diversity and difference is to actually directly engage with them in a respectful, sensitive way. Now, interestingly, that dialogue doesn't have to be face-to-face. -face because now the people, the groups that you're dialoguing with can be in your lounge room on your iPad or on your mobile phone. 
but that dialogue happens in different ways. Um, but it becomes very important. So what does the research actually tell us of the benefits of dialogue? Well, at the country level, it tells us that living in a context of intercultural harmony produces less privileged, less prejudiced societies, that intercultural values are also associated with lower levels of prejudice, that intergroup interactions foster positive relationships, shared experiences, promote cultural understanding, and they also foster a sense of belonging that has a positive impact on health, well-being, and even incidents of drug use. So, if there are principles, and that's our approach through dialogue, how do we do it in schools? Well, interculturalism works on a very rational basis. It assumes it is an intellectual approach, not a, a, it's cognitive, not affective, intellectual, not emotional, and that people can think about these issues. So intercultural education advocates three particular levels, and I'm going to talk briefly about each of these, individual, schools, and society. Now I'm going to share with you a particular strategy that I've developed for working with the schools and, and groups of teachers and students that I call SCRAM. SCRAM for interculturality. So interculturality is the state of being when you become a genuinely intercultural person in the sense that your behaviour is always intercultural. So five steps for developing individuals, and we do this in, in workshops in a much more structured way, but the five steps are stop, look, listen and learn. One of the big mistakes we make is that we look at something from our own perspective and therefore understand that we know it rather than stopping and learning. Critique and reflect on your own attitudes and values and behaviours. Unless we critique ourselves, intercultural learning doesn't happen. Respect other people and their values and their cultures. responsibility by transforming your own views and your own behaviours based on your new knowledge, your critical reflection. And finally, maintain SRAM in all areas of your life. Now the intercultural approach turns upside down the traditional approach that we often use in schools, where it is learning about other cultures. The assumption is, well, I'll get on much better if I learn about others. If I learn about those Aboriginal people, if I learn about the different ethnic groups in my community. Scram and the intercultural approach just says, yes, that's important, but the key thing is that we actually start with ourselves as educators and in our work with children. It then can take a much more developed approach, and this is where we've fleshed it out, around issues around knowledge, around um, attitudes and values, about the particular outcomes that you want. And so this fleshes out some of those principles in, that are involved in the notion of SCRAM, and how we develop individuals. But individuals work and live, go to school in, um, a social context. So what I'm going to share you with is some of the findings from our study, Doing Diversity, which we conducted in Melbourne, with 14 um, schools, seven primary, seven secondary. It was an unusual study because it was an ethnographic study, so it was very intensive. We had researchers 
in the schools, working with the teachers and with the kids constantly um, for two years. And every school had an intercultural coordinator that had been specifically appointed to facilitate the development and uh, to facilitate the research project, um, but to facilitate the school transformation. And so what we were aiming for in this particular project was to create 14 lighthouse schools for intercultural education. Did we succeed? No, I don't think we did. We came a long way towards that, but we didn't necessarily succeed. And it's really, really hard when you know, you're due to do a workshop on intercultural education and none of the teachers turn up. Because one of the boys in year eight has got some hash from his father smuggled it into the cooking class, made hash cookies, and been selling them on the playground. <laughs> and you've got all of the school kids reeling and doped up and ambulances coming. Schools are very complex places with lots of other issues that they actually have to attend to. And intercultural education is just one of those. But the advantage of it is that when it becomes, intercultural education becomes part of your culture, then it's not a project that stops and you finish it. And in fact, the research shows that those sorts of one-off projects have a negligible effect on kids and can actually have a negative effect on teachers' enthusiasm for cultural diversity. What is actually needed is much more of a whole school approach. And I don't know how clear this is at, is at the back, um, but the, I encourage you to go and download the report. You can get it through the research net or through the UNESCO site. But we came up, what well, we did identify from our work with these schools are a couple of key principles. And I'm going to share just some of them um, with you. Key findings. The first one is, Principles make the difference. It's school principles who make or break any initiative. Now this is no, not new news. We know that from the research around literacy, around numeracy, about, around just about everything. But if you've got a school principal who's committed, then something will fly. Less committed or other agendas, it's a different story. And the school principal makes a difference in three particular ways. One is, the school principal develops people as part of their core job. They just don't support, they provide intellectual stimulation, encouragement, they foster improvements. The second thing that principals do is they set the direction for the school. They create the time. They create the priorities. They lead the development of shared goals and agendas. And the third thing that principals did was that they redesigned their schools. And we call this cultural redesign as being part of the taking up of a new mode of practice, one that was characterized by a focus on intercultural, interculturalism as a way of interacting both with peers um, and beyond school, but that also had very high expectations for the kids and for the teachers. And the principals who set very high expectations had the most successful schools. And I suspect that if we looked at other areas, around school achievement, teacher happiness and so on, we would have found the principals with high expectations who are actively involved in encouraging and supporting and empowering this, their staff would have a similar sort of level of success. The other principle that made a difference 
was that they made research-based decision-making. Now, I know after my years of teaching in a high school, a lot of the decisions we make are gut decisions. Too many of our decisions feel right. But when we actually go and look at the research, the research tells us something different. And research-based decision-making, hands down, created more successful schools than where teachers and principals used their gut because it felt right, because that's what they had always done. The other thing that made a big difference was professional learning for teachers. Teachers not the students ended up being rediscovered, were the stumbling block. Teachers had a very, very strong view that they were all very intercultural, very understanding and accepting of diversity, and they did multicultural days, but their understanding was actually very limited. So before we could actually do the work with the kids, we had to do the work with the teachers and get them on the same page. The other thing that was a key was that it needed to be a whole school approach. And that was absolutely decisive. And we had one particular high school, and I had to tell the principal at the end that in all of the indicators that we had used, we had pre-test, protests, we'd done all the statistical Stuff. His school was overwhelmingly, had developed leaps in the two years. He was very confident that of course his school was going to be the best, and it was actually the, the least developed. But he had a very strong view, and we had accepted the position of the principal, that you know, he would restrict intercultural education to a half hour session, all right, once every month. And we said, well, it's a way of life, it's a way of interacting with people, it happens in the playground. It's not a course that you teach, you know, in half an hour. No, 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 I know this will work. So again, gut feeling rather than research based. Whereas the school that actually went ahead, changed their school policy, changed their school plan, wrote it into all their strategic plans, for their courses, implemented it right throughout every level of their school operation, became a different school by the end of the two years, and actually had a long waiting list of parents wanting to get their kids into that school, not because um, of any dramatic change in academic achievement, but because the school had already developed a reputation in the community as a place where people, where the kids really felt that they belonged and where the teachers were intimately involved. So, to finish off, one of the big challenges though that we have is how we can actually change society because schools actually operate in society. And it's very hard for schools to operate as an island ignoring that because every time schools, kids leave our school, um, they're going out into the wider society. And there are five different levels of society. And we heard yesterday that young people today have little faith in government, but these are the three wings of government um, which are supposed to be independent. But the two others are very important, I think, in fostering an intercultural approach in society. One is the free press, and one is the importance of civil society. One of the things that I've been looking at as a researcher is part of the reason why the strategies of the extreme right wing are so successful. And if we look across Europe, moving from east to west, progressive increase in the number of right-wing governments who are in political power. What they're doing, of course, is shutting down um, 
not just shutting down democracy, but shutting down many of the features that mark democracy, the United States, and then, of course, China. And one of the things that they do is that they create a narrative. They create a narrative that's built on negativity, on and on blame, on particular people being excluded and particular people being blamed for that. And I think one of the things that social media and civil society can be active in doing is actually building a new narrative, but a narrative that's actually based on hope, on the potential for the future. And this is a narrative that's going to resonate with young people because as we saw yesterday, um, young people are very optimistic about the future. So if we are going to develop genuinely intercultural schools, we need to also develop an intercultural society that is based and built around hope for development and reform. So we've looked at culture. We've looked at intercultural education, we've looked at some of the strategies. What are some of my take-home messages? Well, first, my first message is that intercultural, inter, the intercultural world happens at three levels, at the individual, at the social, at the school level. And we can't ignore any of those because they all intersect on the future of, of young people. Interculturalism, and this is my second point, I think, reminds us that society needs a moral compass and that the importance of that moral compass for building an optimistic future, a future that has potential. And that, I think, needs to be based on some political principles around human rights, democracy, and the rule of law. So intercultural education isn't just a form of education. It's also a philosophy and a political way of doing education. And education has always been a political act. And my third one, I think, is resonates with Father Jeff. When he opened the conference, he said, we live in a connected world, but we've never been more disconnected. And intercultural education, or whatever variants you decide to adopt, right, is a way of creating that connectedness and that sense of belonging. Thank you very much. <laughs>